So if you're prescribing training, what else would you be looking at? So this, yeah, I okay, just so want to go up that afterwards. Okay, so I'm just in Smith. And there's your rest for recovery. And then again, it comes back to the athlete type. So what they're good at, what they're used to, what they like doing. Energy systems used, yeah. So whether it's a, a lactic session or whether it's an aerobic session or whether it's pure speed and uh, recreation planning stuff. Okay, so what variables can we measure to determine the effect of load that has on an athlete? So I mentioned some of them already. Well, the gym strength, like yeah. numbers. Yeah. So you yeah. Know so that, like, strong, exactly. Yeah, so like something like a catch a movement jump or something like that. Um, we would use that in here a little bit. You do with just a, a jump mat. That they would use that on a Um But that is useful. Yes. Um, from if we take it back even easier, what about even just talking to the athlete and, and seeing how they're how they're coping with it. So literally talking to them and, and, and asking them, um, and then looking at sprint times and training times. So if you have set a session as whatever it is, three one fifties, and on the third one their their times are, are way down, then are they are they achieving what you want them to achieve, and are they tolerating that load? It depends on what your session is aimed at. But if you know why you're doing something, and the athlete isn't responding in the way that you think they are, then maybe that's worth looking at, at adjusting it. So yeah, so yeah, so your subjective reports either to you or via the, the questionnaires we spoke about <coughs> earlier, and then that's where your kind of your number stuff comes in, um, your kind of movement jump, and then things like the opti jump that we have in here. Um, you can look at running biomechanics variables. It's complex, not complicated, and you can look at contact time. So if your contact time is getting longer, you're generally more fatigued. That's pretty much impossible for a lot of you to be. Um, measuring out on the field, but it is something that's potentially available in here, and it is useful for us to have healthy data when we are looking back at injured athletes. So if that was something we could potentially use in the future, etc., etc. Um, so here's my practical guidelines for you. Hopefully, after after again all that scientific stuff. So if you can build up training over time for each KPI, so you're trying to build up things like max velocity, max speed, your acceleration, speed, endurance. That will lead to an accumulation of high chronic workloads. So the athlete will be prepared to do those things. While some of them are, are obviously intertwined, so if you're good at max velocity, that's useful for going into your speed endurance stuff, but they each have to be trained individually as well, if that makes sense, for an athlete to be able to tolerate high training loads in each area. And then if we can minimize spikes in training load, I would say by using common sense in your experience. So as you say, this 10% rule comes really from endurance sports or from pitch-based sports. So using your common sense uh, in terms of how you set out your program, not increasing that significantly week on week, and then look at a block compared to block. Um, and then speed is only a problem if you're not prepared for it. So again, that comes back to that tissue load versus tissue load capacity uh, scales that we had earlier. Um, if you spend your GPP just doing aerobic runs and then think in the next block, I'm going to start sprinters in spikes on track, they will pick up an injury, someone will. Um, but if you actually load speed from the start, not, not in every session, but maybe in a warm up or maybe <coughs> have a day where they're still doing speed at a lower relative intensity, so what they're able to do at the moment in runners, that's a way to get them exposed to a bit of speed, so maybe some acceleration mechanics, maybe some high, high velocity stuff, but slowly increase that over a season. And as your athletes get older and have been exposed to that over a season, then you can do more and more year on year. But it's not trying to do everything in, in, one, season, in one season or in one block, essentially. And then if we look over here, yeah. um, so th there my take home really is train hard but smart. Gradually increase training load. Uh, ask athletes to keep training diary and talk to them about you know, what, they, what they notice subjectively. And then monitor the response to training and adjust things as you need it. This is just a quote from, again, Tim Gabbard, who had a paper recently. Um, the only thing I want to say about it is that you need to remember that factors outside of training can influence the effect that a, a training load you prescribe has on an athlete. So particularly if you're dealing with a lot of youths and juniors, if they have exams coming up, that in itself can predispose them to injury. So actually you may need to pull back a little bit on training intensity 
it around those times. So that's again worth having conversations with the athletes about how they're feeling, how they're coping with school or study or college and their training load then as well. And again, if we that's where we don't want to forget about external and internal load and then intensity and work fatigue. Um, we might come back to this at the end because I still have loads to talk about. Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> about 10 minutes. Yeah. All right, grand. Um, okay, cool. Uh, right, we'll, we'll talk a little. So we've talked a lot about training mode. The, the other side of that is that athletes need to recover well uh, to be able to get the most.